What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook. So today we are going to be reading through the second story in Summer Canophobia, which, of course, is Animatronic Apocalypse. Now, of course, I haven't read this story for myself. I've only read the leaks. This is potentially my favourite story of all time. I think it is incredible. Uh, I think I, I just love the themes in the story and I love how it's presented and stuff. We're going to get to it. Uh, but I'm just saying right off the bat, like this, this is a really good story. So uh, I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, now, before we get started uh, on the title page for Animatronic Apocalypse, it, the, where it says Animatronic Apocalypse, uh, it says underneath it, it says, Join the Fazbear Fan Club every Tuesday and Thursday after school for 5th and 6th graders. Room 13. Be there or beware of the animatronic apocalypse. I like how we've got these little things, like introductions or whatever, um, to the stories on the title pages. But uh, yeah, let's get straight into this. <clears throat> Tuesday. <laughs> uh, 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 yes, I am British, so I did say Tuesday. Um, Tuesday. Glamrock Chica is hunting you. She's chased you into the school library. Your only weapons are a bow or a spear. Your choice. Roll the dice to see if you maim her before she jump scares you. You need more than three to get away. Robbie Wilson picked up the dice and looked at Tina and Nathan, his role-playing group in the Fazbear fan club meeting. They were only... Sorry, they were one of three groups playing the animatronic apocalypse. I choose the bow and arrows, Robbie announced. Come on, higher than three. The dice rolled and landed on the game board as a four and a two. Robbie raised his arms in victory. Yes, Glamrock Chica is maimed and I survive once again. You're too lucky, Nathan complained, but still flashed his braces in a smile. Tina nodded as she pushed up her purple glasses with her finger. You haven't been jump scared once today. Can you share some of that luck with us, please? I can't help it if I roll the right numbers, Robbie said, but he knew it was a combination of luck and strategy. He might roll well, but he also had better odds than Nathan and Tina, who played melee fighters. Robbie preferred ranged weapons and did his best to gather up lots of ammo in case he was swarmed, he moved his game piece, a wooden figurine that he painted with dark clothes, dark hair, and night vision glasses, from the library onto the outer school grounds. Now I get to add the three leftover arrows to my arsenal. Glamrock Chica goes into hiding for recovery. Tina wrote down his moves in their animatronic apocalypse game notebook. She was their game warden and was in charge of tracking play, reading card commands, and making sure players followed the rules. So basically the, the dungeon master, the DM of, <laughs> of the game. Um, the Fazbear fan club had created the animatronic apocalypse game last year. Each of the club members had helped design the game board uh, using the school grounds and surrounding neighbourhood as the fantastical apocalyptic world. They'd pasted maps of the school onto cardboard and created game pieces out of wooden figurines. Robbie's game player name was FF Survivalist, a nod to his love of camping and his love for Freddy Fazbear. Every year, his parents took him camping in the woods for a week and his dad taught him all kinds of survival stuff. By sixth grade, he knew how to tie knots, start a fire, and create a snare. He'd written the game's command cards that had to do with environmental danger. So yeah, he took camping and the animatronic apocalypse to a whole new level. He'd been a Freddy Fazbear fan since he could remember. He went to the Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex practically every weekend. Everyone knew the entertainment mall had the best arcade, the best mini golf, the best raceway, the best pizza, and the best animatronic entertainment. Of course, Glamrock Freddy was his favourite, and the club had been a great way to celebrate Freddy through the week with other fans, especially because he was the only kid at home. His parents were workaholics who didn't mind his obsession with the animatronics as long as he did all his homework. Everybody won. Everyone knew the animatronic apocalypse game was pretend play, a chance to escape into fantasy before it was time to do their real chores and responsibilities. All of the club's members had fun with the game. That sucks, 
their group looked over at Daniel, Johnny and Zabrina's game. At least, most of the club members had fun with it, Robbie thought. Daniel was always a sore loser. Better luck next time, Zabrina told Daniel. You were just jump scared by Roxanne Wolf. Yeah, well, next time I'm going to find a hatchet and take out any animatronic that comes after me. Then you should get better at rolling your dice, Zabrina told him and shrugged. Don't take it too seriously, it's just a game. Robbie waited for Jason to crack a joke and reassure Daniel, like he always did, but their club president didn't say anything. Robbie glanced at the third game. It was one member short. Hey, uh, Jason didn't make it today? Robbie asked. Tina shook her head. No, I haven't seen him at school this week. Maybe he's out sick. Jason had a way of, a re of easing tension by making everyone laugh. Whenever a disagreement came up, or someone got upset at losing, Jason would say, But would it really matter in the middle of the animatronic apocalypse? Too bad he wasn't there to appease Daniel. Robbie felt his cell phone vibrate with a text. It was from Dyson. Practice ended early. Want to walk home now? Robbie thought about playing longer, but he decided to hang out a bit with his best friend. He only got to walk home with him two times a week after the club. I gotta go, guys. You finish without me. Okay, see you on Thursday, Tina said. See ya in homeroom, Robbie, Nathan added. Robbie stuffed his game piece in his backpack and stood, looming over his friends. He'd had a sudden growth spurt this summer, so sudden that his mom had taken him to the doctor. All good, just genetics. His dad seemed to think he would eventually get into school sports like basketball because of his height. He also thought sports would help with expelling some of Robbie's wiggles and squirms, as his dad called his nervous energy. Robbie wasn't so sure about that. Yeah, Robbie had a lot of pent-up energy, but it was all mental. His mind was always focusing on questions. Robbie would pull apart anything he didn't understand until he could find the answer. One answer he couldn't find was whether he would ever stop feeling awkward playing sports with his thin arms and legs. He hadn't yet filled in with muscle, but his dad seemed to think that that would happen too. As Robbie rushed toward the door, he accidentally bumped into a tall figure in a brown suit. Oh, sorry, Mr. Renner. Robbie brushed his dark, black, uh, his dark hair back with his fingers. His mum kept complaining that he needed a haircut. Mr. Renner, the school principal, stood in the doorway of room 13, gazing at his cell phone. He was tall and stocky, and liked to wear brown suits and ties. He had a meticulously combed dark moustache and greying black hair. He always seemed distracted and acted as if maybe being an elementary school principal hadn't been his first career choice. But when it came time to discipline, Mr. Renner could really focus. Most kids were intimidated by just his voice alone. He'd been known to get kids to confess to breaking rules even when there weren't any witnesses. Robbie didn't know any students who really cared what he said unless they were in trouble. Take it easy there, Robbie, Mr. Renner said. Wait, I've got to give him a cool voice. Take it easy there, Robbie, Mr. Renner said. It's important to always watch where you're going. Then he stepped past Robbie, reading his phone, not looking where he was going. Typical adult. Robbie spotted something on his phone screen about horse races with lots of numbers. Mr. Renner glanced up at the club members. Hello, Fazbear Fan Club. Mr. Finkel had a doctor's appointment today, so I'm filling in as club chaperone. Carry on with your games. I'll have an announcement shortly. Mr. Finkel's class was next door, and he would pe peek his head in to observe if he wasn't too busy with his classwork or cleaning his nose. He made it known to everyone that he had severe allergies with a constant nasal drip. Robbie could see some of the club members hunched down in their seats now that Mr. Renner had entered the room. Robbie would have felt constricted with him hovering, hovering over his game too. He was glad to be leaving early. He'd hear about the announcement on Thursday. It was probably something about new school rules. Boring. Robbie hurried out and met Dyson by the school entrance. Dyson and Robbie were pretty much opposites in the looks department, but had still managed to be best friends since kindergarten. Whereas Dyson was shorter and filled out, Robbie was tall and thin. Dyson had red hair and hazel eyes. Robbie had dark hair and eyes. Um, Dyson had a quieter personality and Robbie had always been outspoken. Dyson could sit still for long moments of time and Robbie was in constant motion. 
Robbie's mom joked that he couldn't even sit still when he was fast asleep because he was always moving and kicking off the covers. Dyson was into animatronics too, but Little League took up most of his free time. His parents wanted him to concentrate on improving his game. He couldn't participate in any clubs, and he and Robbie hardly got to hang out uh, together anymore. Since they lived on the same street, they would walk to school in the mornings when they could and walked home together a few times a week. What's happening with the club? Dyson asked him as they walked away from Durham Elementary. Um, fun fact, Durham Elementary, I believe, is the same school that Edward goes to in Friendly Face. I think that's right. Someone correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But um, it could be a connection or it could just be that they both take place in Durham, wherever that is. But uh, I, I don't think it's probably that, that big of a thing. But something to keep in mind, I think. Not much, just playing animatronic apocalypse. I managed to escape unscathed again, facing off with Glamrock Chica. Robbie offered Dyson a strip of peppered beef jerky. Dyson took the jerky. That's cool. What are your stats? 11 in my arsenal. I have a bow and arrows and a throwing spear. Not bad. Hey, you want to hang out at the Mega Pizza Plex this weekend? Dyson shook his head. Can't. Got a game on Saturday, and my dad is taking me to the park to practice on Sunday. Dyson's parents were super into his little league career. They volunteered on the committee, worked in the snack shack, were team parents, and bought all the best equipment for Dyson. Dyson once told Robbie that Little League had been fun at first, but now it was a lot of pressure to score and get people out at third base. Everyone wanted to make it to the sh championships. When he messed up during a game, he could hear some of the parents complain in the stands and sometimes yell at the ump. Robbie wished his own parents had more free time to spend with him, but he didn't envy Dyson. Come on, Robbie complained. All you do is practice. We used to hang out more. Ask if your dad if you can go. All you do is talk about playing animatronic apocalypse. Robbie blinked at the tension in Dyson's voice. He looked at his friend, but Dyson was looking down at the ground while he chewed his jerky. That was sudden, thought Robbie. But he understood that Dyson might be jealous of not having as much free time, so he let it go. Yeah, Robbie agreed. You're right. They walked quietly toward Robbie's house, chewing on the jerky. Well, see ya. Well, yeah, see ya, Dyson said. But Robbie couldn't quite let it go. It didn't feel right. Hey, Dyson? Dyson turned and looked at him. I didn't mean anything by what I said. Dyson shook his head. Don't worry about it. I'd go to the pizza plex with you if I could. Then he turned and walked home. Robbie stuffed the last piece of the jerky into his mouth and watched Dyson walk away with his head lowered, wearing his backpack and holding his baseball bag. He wished he knew how to help Dyson. That was the reason he liked the animatronic apocalypse, the numbers, the rules. It just made more sense than the real world sometimes. <laughs> wink, wink. We're talking about fake realities again. <laughs> uh, as he unlocked the front door, he could hear Hopper barking from inside. Robbie smiled. He loved his dog. Robbie dropped his backpack and got down on the floor to pet him so that Hopper could lick him about a hundred times. Maybe more, since Hopper could smell his jerky breath. Hey there, Hopper. How was your day? Good? Yeah, mine was okay too. Hopper was a small, mixed-breed dog that they adopted three years ago from the local pound. The moment they met, Robbie knew Hopper was his dog. He had been so friendly and playful, and that had never gone away. Robbie looked around his house. Everything looked as it should be. A nice, big, comfy couch in the living area, and a wooden coffee table in the centre of the room in front of their television. A desk was set off to the side with the family computer. Pictures of his dad, mum and himself were on the walls. It was home and it didn't feel so empty when he came home to Hopper. Come on, let's do your outside business, Hopper. Robbie closed the front door and took Hopper out to the backyard. Then he filled up his food and water bowls in the kitchen. Hopper drank some water, then followed Robbie to the front room, where Robbie sprawled his long body onto the couch. His leg bounced as it hung off the cushion. Robbie's cell phone rang right on time. It was his mom. Hey, mom. Hi, Robbie. How was school? He popped his phone between his shoulder and cheek and began to pull at his fingers. Mm, good. That's good. Now stop cracking your knuckles. Robbie dropped his hands. I'm not. Hmm, his mom said, like she didn't believe him. 
Dad and I are going to be late tonight. I have a house showing in the town next and uh, next to Hanover, sorry. And your father has a meeting. He may be home before me. Could you order us dinner? Your choice. But um, maybe not pizza, okay? I have pepperoni growing out my ears. Yeah, sure. What are your plans for this afternoon? I have a little more homework, and I have Hopper to hang out with me. How's Hopper? Robbie glanced at Hopper on the floor, chewing on a big bone. He's chewing his bone, having the time of his life. That's nice. Okay, I'll see you tonight before bed. Love you. Love you too. Robbie's stomach growled as he eyed the kitchen. One more snack before he ordered dinner, and then he'd finish the night with some homework before Dad got home. A typical night in the Wilson household. Thursday. <laughs> I don't know why I laugh at every time. Okay, yeah, whatever. Thursday. Robbie walked into room 13 and read an announcement written on the classroom whiteboard. Fazbear Fan Club President Candidates Johnny Miller, a.k.a. Animatronic Slayer underscore 08, versus Zabrina Z, Zab Fazbear. Confused, Robbie took his regular seat near the back of the class next to Nathan. What's going on? Didn't you hear Jason had to step down as the president of the club? Nathan asked him. Robbie's eyes widened. What happened? His dad got a new job, and he had to move. That sucks. You was a good prez. Yeah. When did this happen? Tuesday, after you left. Rena made the announcement and asked for the candidates. Dang it. I shouldn't have left early on Tuesday, Robbie realised. Robbie wasn't sure, but he might have wanted to run for president had he known what was happening with Jason. Annoyed, he grabbed his finger with his left hand and pulled until his knuckle cracked, then proceeded to crack, crack each knuckle. I don't know if you heard that, but my own knuckle cracked at that time. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, Mr. Renner was already seated at his desk at the head of the class, looking bored. He tapped a small wooden gavel against his desk. Fazbear Fan Club. I told Mr. Finkel I would go ahead and run the vote for the new club president. He waved the gavel toward Johnny. So let's get this ball rolling. Johnny, you're up. Johnny walked up to the podium and peered down at a wrinkled piece of paper in his hands. The paper trembled in his fingers as he read, but no one could understand what he was saying. Speak up, Johnny. We can barely hear you, demanded Mr. Renner. Jo Johnny spoke louder but really fast. I'm Johnny, I'm running for the president of the Fansbury Fan Club. Slower, Mr. Renner said. Um, I would like to run because I think I would be a good president. I would organise community fundraisers for the homeless and um, we could hold a food drive for those in need. Thank you. Johnny quickly walked to his seat to sit down and stare at his, down at his paper, sorry. Mr. Renner leaned back in his seat. All right, Johnny, that was adequate, I guess. Sabrina, your turn. Sabrina strolled up to the podium with a confident smile. Robbie didn't know her that well, but she seemed nice and never seemed to cause any trouble. Hey, Fazbear Fan Club. As you know, I'm Sabrina. I have an annoying voice. <laughs> I know this is my first year with the club at Durham School, but I am a big Freddy Fazbear fan. And if I'm chosen as the president, we won't be doing food drives. We'll be focused on winning the animatronic apocalypse. Robbie's eyebrows lifted as she tapped his fingers on the table. Oh, she's good, he realised. Using roleplay to nab the votes for president would definitely excite the club members. <laughs> we'll create a special team to strategize on how to take the Earth back from the animatronic invaders. Her eyes were big as she spoke with excitement. The club members clapped. Yeah, that would be cool, Tina said. Count me in, a kid named Rick called out. So vote for me and then join my specialised AA team. She raised both hands in fists. And together, we will win the animatronic apocalypse. Mr. Renner actually clapped along with the club members. Very nice, Sabrina, very nice, he said, with a strange smirk on his face. And very smart. Which was a surprise to Robbie. He'd never seen Mr. Renner seem interested in anything. Robbie clapped too. Maybe Sabrina would be a fun president for the club after all. Tuesday. <laughs> Robbie jogged to room 13 as it started to rain. Not only did he like to get to the club meeting early and read the animatronic apocalypse game notebook stats, but he also didn't want to get drenched. When he got to the classroom, he spotted Mr. Renner leaving. Robbie had a moment of relief that he wouldn't be chaperoning the club again today. 
When he walked in, he saw Zabrina sitting at her usual seat in front of the classroom, staring ahead at the whiteboard. Hey, Zabrina, he said to her. Congrats on becoming the new president. Silence. He frowned at the back of her head. Y you okay, Zabrina? She flinched and shifted around to face him. Her eyes looked a little glassy. Oh, hi, Robbie. Thanks. I just have a few announcements before we start gameplay today. It should go quickly. She leaned down and got her notebook out of her backpack. Okay, cool, he said, shaking his wet hair back. Robbie grabbed the notebook to catch up on the latest stats as the other club members strolled in. When he was all up to speed, he pulled out his math worksheet and got started. A few minutes later, Zabrina stood at the front of the class and tapped Mr. Renner's small wooden gavel on the podium. Thank you for voting me in as president. I am truly honoured and I won't let you down when facing off against the animatronics. But first, there will be a few changes with the club. And I don't think you'll care about the changes at all. A small, spile, a small smile curved her mouth. Hey, can someone see if Mr. Finkel is nearby? I appreciate our supervisor, but I want this to be a students only meeting. Daniel walked to the doorway to check. All clear. Cool. Zabrina cleared her throat. <clears throat> Please close the door, Daniel. First up, I've decided that we can't use all of our time doing homework at the club when we need to be planning for the animatronic apocalypse. So what do we do? We copy a classmates. Same goes for quizzes or tests and even reports. Copy notes, copy answers. We have more important things to focus on. As president, I declare that the first 30 minutes of club time is no longer for homework. Straight animatronic apocalypse gameplay all the time. Some kids clapped. Robbie blinked, wondering where this idea had come from. Zabrina was an honor roll student. Shouldn't homework be her jam? I've created lists so that we can tr keep track of which books you've reported on and which tests you have copies of. Sixth graders can help fifth and fifth can help fourth. Getting homework out of the way helps us to be prepared for the apocalypse, right? Right, someone piped up. Second, make sure you sign up for my special AA team or you might just be left out. She looked up at that and Robbie met her eyes for a strange moment. There was something odd about the look, about her, that sent a weird feeling down his back. One moment she had seemed normal, like the Sabrina he'd known around the club, and now it was like a switch had flicked and she had become someone he didn't recognise. Or was it just his imagination? When she looked away, he shrugged it off. Third and most important, nobody, nobody, shares Fazbear Fan Club business outside the club. Not with friends, parents, teachers, no outsiders, period. What's said in the club stays in the club. Why? Robbie cut in, unable to keep quiet any longer. Why are you being so secretive? The club members turned and looked at him with curiosity. I mean, what's the big deal if we share things about the club? We've been doing this for a year and it never mattered before. If you do share, Zabrina said and slammed the gavel hard on the podium. You're out! Some of the kids jumped and Zabrina smiled as if she was pleased with their reaction. Pretty simple. Any other questions? No one answered. Now let me share how the homework list will work and then we can get starts and then we can start signing up. Robbie shifted uncomfortably in his seat. She couldn't kick people out of the club. Could she? He wondered. As Sabrina rambled on, Robbie glanced around room 13. All the members were staring at her intently, taking in her every word. He glanced down on his forearm at his temporary Fazbear fan club tattoo. It was of the Mega Pizzaplex character logo with Fazbear Fan Club underneath. The tattoo was beginning to fade. They'd gotten them a few weeks ago. The club had been fun and light-hearted during the past school year, and now he had a weird feeling that things were changing in a not great way. If he was being honest with himself, he knew the club was his escape from the boredom of school and the emptiness of home, his way to have control in a made-up world. Now, it was getting too real, too serious. Maybe the club wasn't going to be his perfect fantasy escape anymore. Robbie rubbed at the rest of the tattoo with his palm and grabbed his backpack. He went to the back table to finish his homework. He didn't want to listen to any more of Sabrina's weird demands. Later that evening, 
Robbie was in his bedroom working on finishing up a math sheet when his dad popped his head into his room. Hey Robbie, I'm home. Did you eat dinner? Hopper got up and wagged his tail until dad gave him a few pets. Then he waddled back to the floor beside body Robbie's bed. Hey dad, yeah I ordered us subs, they're in the fridge. Pastrami for me? Yep, thanks. Dad came further into his bedroom and nearly tripped over Robbie's hiking boots. Robbie. Sorry, I'll, I'll clean up my room this weekend. Robbie looked around at the pile of dirty clothes he'd thrown on the floor. He wasn't exactly sure how his clothes always missed the basket. But why should his dad care? It's not like he came in enough to notice. Everything else in his room was pretty clean. He had posters of Freddy Fazbear, another of Glamrock Freddy, as well as one from his favourite national park. He always made his bed and his bed was organised enough. Mum wouldn't let him have a television or video game console in his room though. She didn't want him up all hours of the night playing games, which he had to admit would be a definite possibility if he were given the opportunity. We've got a gamer on our hands right here. <laughs> yes, you will clean up if you want Mum to take you to the Mega Pizzaplex on Sunday. Dad sat at the foot of Roddy, Robbie's bed carefully so as to not mess up his grey suit. No one at Dad's bank knew that under his formal shirt were a bunch of colourful tattoos. Dad said he didn't regret getting them because it was a phase in his life that he could look back on fondly, whatever that meant. Tell me about your day, Robbie shrugged. It was okay. Dad lifted his eyebrows. But I can tell something's bothering you. You have a look on your face that tells me something didn't go right. What happened? Nothing big. It's just the president of the Fazbear fan club stepped down and a girl named Zabrina got voted in and she's changing things. Now it might not be as fun anymore. Dad thought about this and laid a supportive hand on his shoulder. Something, sorry, sometimes change is good, even when we can't see it at first. Robbie twisted his lips. I don't think it is in this case. Give her a chance, Robbie. She might end up being a good club president, okay? Thank uh, so much for listening. Yeah, sure. Robbie still didn't think that was likely, but Dad meant well. Come and keep me company while I chow down on that sub. I'm starving. Robbie popped up from his bed, suddenly hungry again. I could eat some more. His dad grinned. Why doesn't that surprise me? I'm getting some big Stranger Things vibes. <laughs> uh, if any of you have seen Stranger Things, it it's very... I, it feels similar with like the whole board game aspect and the friends and kind of... I guess someone like... We, we're kind of assuming, like, Zabrina is, like, possessed by something or something at this point. I, I don't quite know what that would be. But, um, yeah, it, it kind of... It has similar themes to Stranger Things, I think, which is very cool. Um, Wednesday. On Wednesday morning, Robbie and Dyson walked onto the school grounds and spotted a bunch of kids surrounding the outdoor lunch tables. Some kids were even taking pictures with their cell phones. Most of the kids were talking and pointing. Who do you think did it? Someone is so busted. I bet you Mr. Renner is freaking out. What do you think is going on? Dyson asked him. Don't know. Robbie walked closer, peering over someone's head, and his eyes widened. Beware the animatronic apocalypse had been spray painted in big red letters on the courtyard wall. Mr. Homestead, the school janitor, was getting ready to paint over the words. He did not look happy. Holy cow. Dyson whispered when he saw the damage. Robbie rubbed a hand across the back of his neck. I don't believe this. Do you think it was someone from the fan club? Robbie shook his head. I don't think someone from our club would do this. He pictured the club members. They were all quiet kids who just liked to talk about Freddy. Even Sabrina, he thought. He hoped. I mean, no one would go this far. No one wants to get on Mr. Renner's bad side. Yeah, this is pretty awful. Robbie frowned and thought. Our next club meeting isn't till tomorrow. I'm going to try to find something out at lunch. I'll see you then. All through class, Robbie couldn't stop thinking about the spray paint on the walls. It was shocking and out of character for the club, and that really bothered him. Why would anyone do that to school property? What was the purpose? Was it to make the club look bad? And for what reason? At lunch, Robbie found Sabrina sitting at a lunch table with some of the Fazbear fan club members. Dyson followed behind him with his food tray. Robbie smelled someone's homemade soup and another's leftover pizza. His growling stomach reminded him that he was starving and the salami sandwich in his lunch bag was sounding pretty good at the moment. 
but club business came first. Hey, Sabrina, can I talk to you for a sec? Robbie asked her. Sabrina barely looked up from her lunch. Yeah, sure. What about? Just some club stuff. Yeah, I want to talk to you about something too. Robbie lifted his eyebrows. Okay. Sabrina looked directly at Dyson. Sorry, no non-members allowed. She looked back at Robbie with that odd smile. You know the rules, Dyson shrugged. I'll go sit at our table. Then he walked away. Sit down, Robbie. It hurts my neck to look up at you. Robbie sat across from her, next to Rick. Go ahead. You first. Wait. Oh, no, oh it was Robbie saying. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead. You go first. Why didn't you list your homeroom reports and tests as I requested at the meeting? Robbie made a face. Because that's not what the club is about. She stared at him. Everybody else did it. But you. Robbie shrugged. So? So, if you're part of the club, then you have to do what the club does. Are you serious? New club rules. No one else seems to mind. Robbie felt tension in his back. Fine, he muttered. But he wasn't giving his homework to anybody to copy. What's going on with that graffiti on the school walls? Zabrina continued to eat her salad. What about it? It's pretty obvious. That's vandalism of school property. The school is going to want to question the club. He could get sh we could get shut down because of it. It's not cool. And whoever did it wasn't thinking about the consequences. I don't think they were thinking at all. Relax. Nothing's going to happen. They have to prove someone from the club did it anyway. Robbie narrowed his eyes at her. Do you know who did it? Sabrina shook her head as she stabbed at a crouton, popped it in her mouth and chewed. Robbie glanced at the rest of the table. What are you smiling at, Daniel? Was it you? Don't know what you're talking about, Wilson. Daniel sneered and bit into his candy bar. Then through a mouthful, he asked, Are you sure you're even part of this club? Doesn't seem like it. A few of the members snickered at Daniel's words. Irritation washed over Robbie. I've been a member since day one. Same as you, more than I can say about others. Daniel glared and looked like he was about to argue when Sabrina interrupted. Relax, Robbie. You're being too intense. Just don't worry about the paint on the walls. The school already covered it up. Nothing's going to happen. The club will be fine. Robbie looked at everyone. They were staring at Robbie, Sabrina and Daniel as if waiting for their conversation to go nuclear. And for a moment, Robbie felt like an outsider, a loner among members of what had been his favourite club, the club to which he dedicated hours of conversation and planning and playing, where he'd hung out and laughed with friends. Where was the fun now? Well, whoever did it is just going to get us all in trouble and make the club look bad. I would think a president would care about that. Sabrina zipped her... <laughs> I keep saying... Because Sabrina is spelt with a, a Z, just to clear up, if you don't have the book in front of you. Um, <laughs> so I, I was just like, Sabrina zipped instead of Sabrina sipped her milk. Um, too bad you're not the president, and I am. Yeah, too bad, Robbie thought, and stomped away from their table. He looked back and everyone seemed to have their heads closer together. It felt weird, as if they were plotting something. Robbie frowned and went to sit at the table with Dyson. What did she say? Dyson asked through a mouthful of hot dog. Robbie shook his head and dug out his sandwich from his lunch bag. She says it's nothing to worry about, but I'm not convinced she doesn't know who did it. I think she's hiding something. Just then, Mr. Renner walked up to the cement block in the middle of the courtyard where teachers like to make lunch announcements. Hello, Durham Wildcats, he bellowed. Mr. Renner's deep voice travelled far. Robbie's breath caught. Had Mr. Renner found out who vandalised the school? Was the club going to be punished? I have a special announcement. I want you to be part of the decisions we make here at school. This week, we will have a special election and all students will be encouraged to vote on changes here at Durham. How does that sound? There was some clapping from the students but most kids ignored him. Mr. Renner's eyebrows lowered over his eyes. Have you all heard of the animatronic apocalypse? He bellowed out dramatically. Suddenly, the students came alive with a few cheers erupting around the courtyard. Robbie and Dyson eyed each other in disbelief. Then Robbie swung his gaze over at Zabrina's table with some of the club members. Their cheers were the loudest. Mr. Renner looked almost happy. I thought you might have. An apocalypse is serious business, 
As a school community, it's time to come together to prepare for this inevitable battle. It's either us or them. The animatronics versus the Durham Wildcats. More clapping and cheers echoed from the students. What was he getting at? Robbie wondered. Why did Mr. Renner suddenly care about some game their club had made up? It's not like every student was involved. There will be a bellow item called the Faculty Preparedness Initiative. Mr. Renner pointed to the students. Say it with me. Faculty Preparedness Initiative. Students repeated the title with him. We need resources to help prepare our... Sorry, I completely forgot I was doing that accent. We need resources to prepare our teachers and faculty to be able to fight against the dangerous animatronics. We cannot be sitting ducks when this apocalypse happens. We have to be able to protect our students, to protect you. Someone whistled. <laughs> I can't do it. We need, we need you to vote, Durham. Our plan is to move around some funding here at school. Everyone will have what they need. What's most important is that you, our students, will benefit by having your teachers ready and prepared for this animatronic apocalypse so that you can be protected and we can take back our planet. Are you with me? Cheers erupted from the crowd. These animatronics won't know what hit them. Voting will open tomorrow until Friday after school. Enjoy your lunch. One more thing. No more vandalising school property, or there will be serious consequences. That's all. Carry on. Robbie shook his head in disbelief. Can you believe this? He asked Dyson. He basically wants to take money from the school to fund something that doesn't really exist. And he's coursing it over with gameplay. I think maybe he's trying to get the students more involved. Robbie leaned toward Dyson across the table. Don't you get it? He's taking money from somewhere in the school to give more money to himself and the teachers. You know, my dad's in banking. He's always telling me about how funding works. I usually don't pay much attention, but this time what he told me finally makes sense. Dyson shrugged. I don't see the big deal. Robbie shook his head. It doesn't sound right, is all I'm saying. And what's with not making a big deal over vandalism? Normally he'd be interrogating suspects to get to the bottom of it. Robbie, relax. I think you're still upset about Sabrina being the new president and making new rules. Not just new rules. She's telling the club to cheat. It's weird. Still, has anyone told you you're not good with change? Robbie let out a breath and rolled his tense shoulders. Maybe. They continued to eat their lunch and Dyson changed the subject by talking about his new video game. But Robbie couldn't shake the feeling that something just wasn't right. Thursday. That same feeling popped up again when Mr. Renner showed up to the Fazbear fan club meeting after school. Hi, Mr. Renner, Sabrina said as the principal entered the classroom. Hello, Sabrina, and hello, Fazbear fan club, Mr. Renner said to the members. It's great to see so many of you working toward the, sus at the success of mankind against the animatronic apocalypse. Robbie groaned in irritation. Thanks so much for allowing us to vote. Oh, wait, it's not him. <laughs> Thanks so much for allowing us to vote on the new faculty preparedness initiative, Daniel said. I've never had a principal gi- wait, this is a Scottish guy, isn't it? I've never had a principal give the students a, vo a choice before. I voted this morning. It was really cool. Thank you, Daniel. That's my pleasure. I want us to be a team and work together to be prepared. You're my hero, Mr. Renner, Tina said with a smile. I voted for the initiative too. Me too, said Nathan. Well, thank you, Tina and Nathan. Good job. Mr. Renner walked around the room, chatting with the club members. Robbie kept his head down as he read over the latest game stats, hoping Mr. Renner would ignore him. He didn't. Hey there, Robbie. How are you doing? Fine. Robbie looked up at Mr. Renner and began to tap his pencil on his notebook. Mr. Renner scanned the notes. Robbie, you seem to do really well on the game stats. Yeah. Robbie tried to not let himself buy into whatever Mr. Renner was up to. Your expertise will come in handy for our faculty preparedness initiative. Robbie couldn't hold his tongue any longer. You're kidding, right? Mr. Renner lifted his eyebrows. Why would I be kidding? Robbie looked around and lowered his voice. Because, you know, it's not real. Something flickered in Mr. Renner's eyes before he leaned down in front of Robbie's desk. He was so close. Robbie could smell an unappealing aftershave. What's the matter, Robbie? Don't feel like playing in the Fazbear fan club anymore?
Robbie blinked at the shift in Mr. Renner's tone. It was like he had... Uh, sorry, it was like he was no longer the principal, but some mean kid taunting him. He saw a muscle twitch under Mr. Renner's eye, and Robbie looked down at his desk. Robbie shifted in his seat, uneasy. I didn't say that, he answered quietly. You didn't say what, Robbie Wilson? I didn't say that I was done with the club, Mr. Renner. Good. I know it's all a game, Robbie, but I'm going to utilise what I need to encourage our students to get more involved here at school. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Robbie looked up and met his gaze once more. Mr. Renner's eyes seemed to bore into Robbie's head. Even though Robbie didn't agree with him, he shook, he shook his head just to get that penetrating stare off him. Mr. Renner quickly straightened and walked to Zabrina's desk, and Robbie sighed with relief. Now, Mr. Renner said to the club, voting is still open until after school tomorrow. Remember that this helps you, the students, so don't let us down. And it helps fill your pockets, Robbie noted grudgingly. Mr. Renner crossed his arms and started to talk quietly to Zabrina. He thought he saw Zabrina give Robbie a quick, irritated look before she looked back at Mr. Renner. She seemed to gaze as, at Renner as if she was uh, hung on his every word. Sheesh, what a principal's pet, Robbie thought. Robbie realised he'd had enough. He was tired of the way everything was changing, tired of feeling like an outsider among his friends. He packed up his stuff to leave. Nathan and Tina looked at him, wondering where he was going. Sorry, I gotta go. Catch, catch you on the next game. Mr. Renner had given Robbie an uncomfortable feeling, and he knew he wouldn't enjoy himself with the principal hanging around. He walked out of the classroom and saw a huge line of kids waiting to vote on the dumb, made-up initiative. Team coaches had even brought their sports teams to vote when they were supposed to be practising. He spotted Dyson with his team, waiting in the line. Let's go, he heard Coach Baker say to the crowd. There was a playful smile on his face. Get your votes in. We need to be trained and prepared for the animatronic apocalypse. Some of the kids gave him high fives after they voted. Good job, kids. Thanks for helping to protect our school. When were they going to all wake up? Robbie wondered. Why was he the only one seeing the bigger picture here? Maybe this really was the beginning of the animatronic apocalypse. He just didn't know it. Because he was starting to feel like he might be in some weird alternate dimension. Shaking off the, uh, questions he couldn't answer, Robbie texted Dyson that he was walking home early. He didn't feel like company at the moment. Robbie took off down the residential streets toward home. The sun was trying to break through the overcast clouds and the light rain that had been consistent during the week. He heard a distant lawnmower and a couple of birds chirping. What am I going to do about Mr. Renner's initiative? He wondered. Should he tell his dad something weird was going on with the principal at school? Should he tell him about the voting? Would his dad even believe him? He guessed he could try. Distracted as he was in the quiet of his thoughts, Robbie leaped when he heard a cat screech loudly from behind him. Surprised, Robbie whirled aloud, but he didn't see any sign of a cat. He saw a couple of parked cars and trash cans left at the curb, but no animals. He turned back to continue home. He looked at the houses and didn't see anyone outside. It was strangely empty for the normally busy neighbourhood. The sound of a shoe scraping on the ground from behind him made him jerk around. His pulse skittered. Was someone following him? No one was there. Were they hiding? A sense of unease stirred in his stomach. He turned and picked up his pace to go home, peeking over his shoulder every few seconds. His breath quickened. He turned down his street, nearly running to get to his house. Ow! Something hard knocked the back of his head. Robbie stopped and looked down at the ground to see a large rock roll to its side. There was a drop of blood on yeah, there was a drop of blood on it. Robbie spun around. He couldn't see anyone, but he heard footsteps of someone running away around the corner. That wasn't funny, he yelled to the rock thrower. Robbie raised his hand to his head and hissed at the sting. There was a little bit of blood on his fingers. His unease turned to irritation as someone's mean idea of a prank. He walked up the pathway to his house to clean his wound. Hopper barked and jumped as Robbie opened the door but whined when Robbie didn't stop to pet him. Sorry, Hopper. Hold on a sec. Robbie went straight to the bathroom and grabbed some toilet paper to dab at the wound. There was still a little blood oozing from his head. Sighing, Robbie looked for a bandage. A couple hours later, Robbie's dad came through the door, holding a box of tacos and his leather briefcase. Hey, son, give me a hand here. Robbie took the box of tacos and set them on the kitchen table. How was school? Dad asked him. Good. Did you feed Hopper? Yeah. 
Okay, good. Wash up for dinner. Your mother has a late house showing. Did she tell you? Bobby nodded. So, she'll be home before your bedtime. It's just us for dinner. His dad squinted his eyes at him. What's wrong with your head? Bobby hadn't known how to put the bandage on, so he taped some gauze to his head. I, uh, got hit in the head. Some kid threw a rock. What's that about? Let me see. His dad pulled off the tape with a few strands of hair. Ow! Sorry. Well, there's no bump. Just a little scratch. You'll be okay. Who did this? Robbie shrugged. Just some kid, probably. I didn't see who threw it. Robbie went to wash up at the kitchen sink, and then they both settled down at the table to eat tacos. Hey, Dad, Robbie asked. Don't talk with your mouth full, Robbie. Robbie swallowed. Is it weird to have kids vote on a school initiative regarding funding? His dad lifted his eyebrows. I think the parents or the school board would be more qualified to vote than the students. Kids your age don't have all the facts and figures. Right. Mr. Renner is making an initiative that pays the teachers more money, and he's having the students vote on it this week. Dad frowned. I don't think that's what's really happening, Robbie. You must be confused. Robbie sighed. Dad, I listen to you when you talk about funding and all that stuff, and this is exactly what Mr. Renner is doing. He is putting more money toward the teachers and himself. You always tell me the money has to come from somewhere, so he could be taking it from school equipment, field trips, or even activities in order to pay himself more. It's what he's doing, I promise. Well, if he is, it has to be for something very important. He says it's to fund for preparation against the animatronic apocalypse. Dad let out a big sigh and brushed off cheese from his fingers. Ah, right. The apocalypse. Robbie, what have I told you about fantasy versus reality? Robbie was offended. He tapped a thumb to his chest. I'm not making this up. He sat in front of all the upper grades at lunch. Ask Dyson if you don't believe me. Dad looked at him for a long moment. Sometimes you might think what you see is true when there is another side to the story. Discouraged, Robbie just stared at his remaining taco. All right, Dad said. Finish up your taco and get to your homework. I've had a long day and I'll check in with the school tomorrow and get their side of the story about this initiative. Sure. Maybe there was another side of the story. Maybe. Friday. Robbie sat in a homeroom participating in silent reading with the rest of the class. The only problem was the book was boring. It had no warriors or battles or anything interesting. Not even anything about surviving in the wilderness. How did teachers expect kids to read this stuff without falling asleep? He looked around the classroom. Some of the students were reading. Others had their heads down, quickly turning the pages in the book. Robbie raised his hand. Yes, Robbie. Mr. Gustin asked, peering at him over his narrow glasses from his desk at the front of the class. Can I use the rest, the restroom, please? May. May I use the restroom, please, Mr. Gustin? Mr. Gustin waved a hand. Go ahead, but be quick about it. Robbie sprang out of his seat and grabbed the wooden restroom pass hanging on the wall by a string. I didn't know that was an actual thing. Was that an actual thing? That's crazy. America is crazy. <laughs> he walked down the school hallway and spotted Mr. Renner stepping out of the school office to speak with a student with dark hair. As Robbie walked closer, he noticed the student he was talking to was Zabrina. Robbie wasn't sure what to do. After his intimidating conversation with Mr. Renner, he didn't really want to talk with him again, especially if his dad was going to call the school and ask about the initiative. He looked right and left and finally ducked behind a corner of the school building, then peeked around the wall. He was too far from them to hear what was being said, but it was odd how Mr. Renner was staring very intently at Zabrina as he spoke to her. No one else is in the room where it happened. <laughs> uh, Zabrina nodded her head, and then Mr. Renner walked back into the school office. Robbie watched Zabrina stand very still after that, not even moving. It was like she was staring off into space. What's the matter with her? Robbie wondered. Curious, Robbie moved back into the hallway, swinging his ba wooden bathroom pass around by its string. As he made his way close to Sabrina, he expected her to smile or wave. Instead, she started to walk forward. Robbie nodded his head toward her. Hey, Sabrina. But she just strolled right past him without saying a word. Hello, Sabrina? Robbie stopped and watched her walk away without acknowledging him. Weird, he muttered. Just then, Robbie saw a very important-looking man and woman stride toward the office with briefcases and stern faces. The man nodded to Robbie, and Robbie nodded back. 
Uh, Robbie read on his name tag, Mr. Ted Angelo, school superintendent. Robbie figured he was pretty important in the school hierarchy. Since he didn't really have to use the restroom, Robbie took the long route back to the homeroom. Did you hear? Mr. Renner is leaving Durham. No way! Yeah, someone saw him packing up his desk. As Robbie walked to the hallways after school, he'd overheard a kid talking to another kid about Mr. Renner, and his eyes widened. He told his dad about his suspicions about the initiative, and his dad had called the school and must have found out something, possibly that Mr. Renner had been doing something wrong. Robbie wasn't sure how to feel about that. It wasn't like it had been Robbie's idea for Mr. Renner to take from the school funding and give more to himself, but he hadn't meant to get the principal fired. Robbie headed home alone since Dyson had a game that day. As he walked out the school gate, he spotted a bunch of the club kids walking together, with Sabrina and Daniel leading the pack. Robbie frowned. Today wasn't a club day. Did he miss a message about another meeting? Curious, he followed the kids out onto the grass field. They were all ex- eh, exciting, exiting the school grounds through the back gate. He stayed a little ways away, just in case he had been intentionally left out. Maybe they found out that it was his dad that had questioned Mr. Renner's initiative. Maybe they were mad at Robbie and would try to kick him out of the club. Robbie hoped that wasn't the case. The group walked through the residential streets until they came upon a small neighbourhood playground called Willow Park. It had an old slide, swings and a rusted merry-go-round. There were tall trees surrounding the park that led into a forest area. Robbie's parents had told him many times to not go into the forest area by himself. It could be dangerous. Instead of stopping at the playground, Robbie followed them further into the trees. Technically, he wasn't by himself. When the group finally stopped walking, uh, Robbie peered behind a tree and spotted Sabrina talking to someone. Robbie couldn't see who it was because the person was blocked by a tree. Then the person stepped forward. It was Mr. Renner. Robbie's eyes widened as he slouched behind the tree. His pulse sped up. Mr. Renner wasn't the principal anymore, but he was still meeting with the club outside school grounds in the woods. Something was very wrong. Robbie took a calming breath as he cracked his knuckles. There could be a simple explanation. Maybe they were just saying goodbye and then they would be on their way. Maybe Mr. Renner had something important to tell them before he left for good. Robbie peered behind the tree. Dang it. He was too far away to hear what they were saying. He watched Mr. Renner kneel down on the ground and run his fingers through some dirt. Robbie got down on his hands and knees and crawled to get a little bit closer, just like his dad had told him when, cl when camping and spying on wildlife. He spotted at a falling log and peered at the group. The club members surrounded Mr. Renner, listening to him intently. The weird thing was, there were no smiles on his friends' faces, no laughter, no expressions at all. Mr. Renner showed the dirt to them, and all the club members kneeled on the ground as he did. Here we go, guys. Here we go. <laughs> Robbie frowned. What were they going to do? Dig something up? He watched the kids run their fingers through the dirt, then gather the dirt into their hands. He could hear bits and pieces of Mr. Renner's voice. This dirt is very important. It will help immunity against animatronic toxins. Then Mr. Renner said something in his demanding tone. But he couldn't have said what Robbie thought he heard. It sounded like he had said, Eat it. Robbie watched Zabrina and Daniel eat a mouthful of dirt. And then he watched in horror as the other club members ate the dirt one by one. Mr. Renner nodded and looked pleased. Zabrina looked at all the club members eating dirt, and she smiled. There was dirt all over her teeth. Robbie's heart was beating fast. This was too weird. This couldn't be happening. Maybe he did have trouble distinguishing fantasy from reality. Scared, he crawled away from his hiding spot until he could get to his feet to run. He ran as fast as he could toward home. He just wanted to get home. Late at night in his room, Robbie texted Dyson to call him as soon as he could. His parents were finally asleep. Robbie hadn't told them about what he had witnessed at the park, but he wanted to talk to someone. This was so much worse than Mr. Renner taking money from the school. What he'd watched had seemed so strange and horrible that he didn't think he could tell his parents. They surely wouldn't believe him. Robbie wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't seen it for himself. Maybe Dyson wouldn't even believe him. Earlier, Dad and Mum had sat him down on the couch and talked to him about Mr. Renner. Honey, Mum said. You were right to tell your father about Mr. Renner's school faculty initiative. It was wrong, and it hadn't been approved by the school board or the district. Dad had put a hand on his shoulder. I'm glad you told me, son. I'm proud of you for speaking up. I'm sorry I wasn't convinced at first. It had seemed strange, so I had to double-check the facts. But you were right. 
and I had the school district look into it. Just know that it's not your fault for speaking up. It was Mr. Renner's fault for making a bad choice. Robbie had merely nodded. Mum had sat next to him and gave him a hug, thinking he was upset about Mr. Renner leaving, but really had been upset about seeing Mr. Renner make his friends eat dirt. <laughs> his phone vibrated with a call from Dyson. Robbie grabbed his flashlight, flicked it on, and huddled over the or under the covers. Sorry. What's up? Dyson asked in a lowered voice. Why are we talking so late? If my parents find out, I'm busted. Look, same here, but I saw something really bad today. Robbie spoke quietly into the cell phone. What do you mean, really bad? Well, you heard about Mr. Renner leaving the school. Yeah, some of my teammates were talk uh, talking about it in the game. I saw him meet with a club after school. But there's no meetings on Fridays. Exactly. I was curious, so I followed them to Willow Park and saw... What? Robbie told Dyson everything. Are you making this up? Dyson wanted to know. No, I swear on our friendship, Dyson. I saw it and it really happened. This is so weird. Why would Mr. Renner do that? What are you going to do? Are you going to tell your mum and dad? I can't. There's no real proof. They won't believe me. There's no way my dad can call to find out the truth about something like this. Well, you need to talk to the club separately. When they're not all together, find out what happened and why. That's just gross. Yeah, I know. But I'll have to wait till Monday. Or maybe this weekend I can go by Johnny's house. I know where he lives. I would go too, but I have a game and practice all weekend. Dyson sighed into the phone. It's okay. I'll let you know how it goes. Dyson? Yeah. Thanks for believing me. It was really weird watching it happen. Yeah, well, that's why I know you're telling the truth. Truth is stranger than fiction. My mum says that all the time. Ooh. That's a, that is a great line. I love that. Saturday. <laughs> Having busy pe parents made it easy to slip out. Uh, Johnny lived only a block away from Robbie's house. The atmosphere was surprisingly muggy given the gloomy clouds that hung in the sky. He passed a house with a couple of little kids playing with a dog in their yard. He walked by a guy washing his car. He finally turned down the next street where Johnny lived. Johnny lived in a nice two-story house painted blue with white shutters attached to the windows. On one side of the driveway, a bike was lying on the ground and a basketball hoop stood on a plastic stand. A minivan was parked on the other half of the driveway. Robbie walked up to the front door and knocked. After a moment, a woman answered. Her hair was tied back and her eyes looked tired. She was cuddling a toddler with honey brown hair on her hip. The toddler waved a plastic block in one hand. Hi, can I help you? The woman said to Robbie. Robbie shifted nervously on his feet. Hi, I'm Robbie. I go to school with Johnny. We're in homeroom and the same Fazbear fan club together. The woman nodded. Oh, hi, Robbie. Sorry, Johnny isn't feeling so well today. Oh, he's sick? A little. He has an upset stomach and can't seem to get out of bed. I'm hoping if he rests this weekend, he'll be able to go to school on Monday. So I'm sorry, but he can't have any visitors today. Robbie scratched his head. Did he, um, eat something bad? Eat, eat, said the toddler. Well, I don't know, Johnny's mum said. He didn't have much dinner last night, so he might have just caught a little bug at school, or maybe he got a bit of the toxin. Okay, Robbie blinked. Wait, what? Take care of yourself, Robbie. Bye. Bye, echoed the toddler as the door quickly closed. Confused, Robbie turned and walked away. He might have heard Johnny's mum wrong. It sounded like she said toxin, but that can't be right. He looked up at the two-story house and saw a curtain move in a window, as if someone had been looking down at him. Was that Johnny at the window? He wondered. Robbie stared at the window a moment longer, but it didn't move again. As Robbie walked home, he wished he had gotten to talk to Johnny to find out what was really going on. He was just going to have to wait until Monday to get some answers. Monday. <laughs> Robbie was in morning homeroom when he saw Johnny come in, but Nathan was nowhere to be seen. Johnny looked a little paler than usual with dark eyes, or with dark circles under his eyes. His hair wasn't even gelled up like usual. Robbie walked up to Johnny's desk. Hey, Johnny. Johnny nodded. Hey. I came by your house this weekend. Johnny squinted at him. Yeah, that was weird. You never come to my house. Robbie scratched his neck. Well, I just wanted to see how you were doing. Um, your mum said you weren't feeling well. Johnny shrugged. I was okay. Did you eat something bad? 
Johnny shook his head, but he looked uncertain. I feel fine. Okay, that's good. Where's Nathan? Do you know? Johnny scanned their homeroom. Dunno. Hope the animatronics didn't get him. Ro Robbie raised his eyebrows. What did you say? Johnny sat down, but didn't answer him. He started to rub the tips of his fingers. Robbie realised there was redness beneath Johnny's fingernails. What happened to your fingers? Johnny lifted his hands, spreading his fingers out. There were a few tiny lines of red on each of his fingertips, spearing underneath his fingernails. Jeez, that looks bad, Robbie told him with a wince. Johnny looked at him intently, with wide bloodshot eyes. We had to poke the needle under our nails. We had to, to protect ourselves. It's a secret though, don't tell anyone. It's a secret. Wait. Oh, I, I was a little bit confused because there's a mistake in the book where it doesn't end the speech marks. So, like, there's just, like, no speech marks to end the... I was confused on whether that was speech or not, but it, it clearly was. It's a secret, Johnny muttered again. A shiver slid down Robbie's back as he moved away from Johnny's intense gaze and sat down for class attendance. Tuesday! <laughs> It was nearing the end of the school day as Robbie answered history questions in his workbook. He glanced at Nathan and t noticed him staring intently at the classroom clock. He hadn't had a chance to talk to his friend alone since he'd returned to school. Robbie glanced at the clock and noticed it was a few minutes before 2pm. School didn't end for another half hour. School's ending at 2.30pm? What the hell? Uh, Robbie finished off his answers and as he was putting his workbook away, he spotted Johnny gazing at the clock too. Frowning... Jo uh, Robbie glanced at Nathan and then back to Johnny. Both the kids were still staring at the clock. Robbie looked up in time to see the clock hands move to two o'clock. He noticed uh, Nathan move fast, but then Johnny. They each pulled out small tin boxes from their desks. The boxes were the kind used for small mints. What are they doing? Robbie wondered. Robbie sat closer to Johnny, so he watched Johnny open the box. Inside was something black and moving. Robbie's eyebrows lifted as Johnny pulled out a huge black beetle the size of a thumb from the tin box. Johnny looked at the beetle, watching their little legs move unsuccessfully in the air. The insect's wings fluttered as if it were trying to fly away. Robbie thought he heard the beetle screech as Johnny suddenly sucked the beetle straight into his mouth. What? Why? Robbie gripped the edges of his desk as Johnny chewed with a determined look on his face. Then his cheeks got big and his body jerked forward as if he might throw up. Johnny slapped a hand to his mouth. Robbie turned his gaze back to Nathan and watched him pop a large beetle into his mouth with his eyes squeezed shut. Nathan curled his hands into fists, trying to swallow the live beetle and then he gagged. Robbie, ga uh, Robbie glanced around at the other classmates to see if they were witnessing this disgusting bug eating. But as he looked, he realised that he was the only one not eating. Robbie sat, shocked, as his entire homeroom shoved the beetles into their mouths. Some of the kids chomped hard, others held hands on their mouths with tears streaming down their cheeks. Coughs erupted as kids had a hard time swallowing the insects whole. Robbie jerked his head toward their teacher. Mr Gustin had to stop this. But Mr Gustin simply stared glassy-eyed at the students, doing absolutely nothing. Robbie took a breath as he slowly turned his attention back to Johnny. He was writing in a workbook, and Nathan was now working quietly as well. Robbie swiveled his head around to look at the other students in the classroom. Everyone was working quietly as if nothing extremely weird had just happened. Robbie scrubbed his hands down his face and laid his head on the desk. Sweat sprouted on his forehead as his stomach rolled. He tried to calm himself and push the horrible incident out of his brain until the bell rang. After the bell rang, Robbie rushed to the, ro the boys' restroom. He was breathing too hard, and he thought he might throw up. He managed to get to the sink, push on the cold water tap, then splash water on his hot face. It's okay, he whispered to himself. Everything is okay. He didn't really believe it, but he was trying hard to convince himself. He glanced up at the bathroom mirror and saw two of his classroom home, his homeroom classmates, sorry, Will and Adrian, standing behind him. Oh, hey guys. Robbie said to them as he turned to face them with water dripping off his face. Will's eyebrows pulled together. Did you forget something, Robbie? Robbie's eyes widened as he looked at Will and then Adrian. No? What? He had his backpack on. Did I leave my binder in, in homeroom? Will gave a nod to Adrian. 
Robbie watched Adrian pull a small tin box from a zippered pocket in his backpack. Robbie pushed back against the sink. Uh, no, um, yeah, I think you did, Robbie. I think you forgot to take your toxin protection. Robbie was not about to eat a wiggling, hard-shelled beetle. He beelined to the right, and Will snatched the front of his hoodie with two hands to stop him from leaving. Will was shorter than him, but he had a really strong grip. Not so fast. You've got to take your protection, just like the rest of us. You don't want to infect us all, do you? Robbie shook his head. No, no, I, I can't. Adrian held the large beetle in front of Robbie's nose. Sure you can, Adrian said with a smirk. It's not so bad. The beetle wiggled its thin arms and legs in front of Robbie's nose, its black wings flapping frantically like a butterfly. A tiny screech pierced Robbie's ears. Robbie slammed his mouth shut. Will released one hand from Robbie's sweatshirt to squeeze his jaw open. Robbie took the chance to slam a foot on Adrian's shoe and shoved Will aside. They both stumbled back and Robbie booked it out of the bathroom as fast as he could. He ran all the way to room 13 to try to hide from his classmates. He didn't understand what was going on with everyone. He tried to open the door, but it was locked. He discovered a note taped onto the closed door. Fazbear Fan Club is cancelled today due to a scheduling conflict. Come back on Thursday. Cancelled? Robbie questioned. Why? Robbie peeked next door into Mr Finkel's room. The teacher was blowing his nose into a handkerchief. Robbie swallowed hard. Hi, Mr Finkel. Fazbear Club is cancelled today? How come? Mr Finkel waved and wiped his nose. Don't know anything about it. Mr Renner is, or was, the chaperone for Fazbear Club. I was dismissed. Mr Finkel gave a weird sound like a snort. Now who's dismissed? He murmured. Um, okay. Robbie tried to, uh, Robbie turned to walk away. He scanned the hall looking for Will and Adrian, but didn't see them. Hopefully they'd given up and gone home. Robbie wondered why Sabrina had cancelled the meeting. A scheduling conflict with what? Even if the president of the club couldn't make the meeting, the club still could have the meeting so that the other members could play Animatronic Apocalypse. Robbie suddenly stopped in his tracks, unless the entire club wouldn't be coming to the meeting either. Was there another secret gathering that he didn't know about? Robbie turned his gaze toward the school's back entrance. He didn't see any club members walking toward the back fence, but he decided to check out Willie Willow Park again. As he walked to the park, he hoped he wouldn't find the club members eating anything they weren't supposed to. His stomach roiled just thinking about it. When Robbie arrived at the park and walked into the trees, there was no sign of the club members. Relief seeped through him. To Robbie, it meant that everyone was safe at the moment. He took off back through the park. He had to go by the school to get home, but he walked slowly to make sure no one was following him. And that was when he saw Zabrina walking out of the school gate with Daniel. Meet at the park tonight, Zabrina told Daniel. Don't tell anyone. All right, Prez, don't... <laughs> i got to do the Scottish accent, sorry. All right, Prez, no, war no problem, Daniel said. Hold on a sec, Zabrina told him. She took something out of her school bag. It looked like the same small beetle box. Oh no, Robbie thought. She removed the lid and offered it to Daniel. Daniel looked at her, then down at the tiny box. I already had one at two o'clock, like I was supposed to. You want extra defence to keep you safe from the toxins, don't you? When Daniel hesitated, Zabrina shrugged. Fine, if you don't want to be protected. I do, Daniel said quickly, with an intense look on his face. He reached in and plucked out the black beetle. Daniel stuffed it in his mouth, squeezed his eyes shut, and attempted to swallow. Suddenly, Daniel grabbed his throat and seemed to force himself to chew the beetle in order for it to go down. Robbie shuddered. Zabrina flashed her teeth in a bright smile. Daniel walked away, shaking his head as if the taste was super unpleasant. Robbie had to get to the bottom of this. Hey, Zabrina, he called out. Zabrina slipped a small box into her bag and then simply stood, unmoving. Zabrina, he ran up to her. Zabrina didn't look at him or acknowledge him. Frustrated, Robbie stood in front of her. Zabrina, why are you ignoring me? Zabrina continued to stare at his neck. Her eyes were glassy and unblinking. Her pupils were large and round. Unease trickled down Robbie's back. Hey, are you okay? A car pulled up to the school curb. Zabrina suddenly blinked and looked at Robbie. My ride's here. I gotta go, she murmured. What? Wait, um, why would you cancel the club meeting? He was trying to get her to talk to him. Zabrina didn't answer him as she got into the car with an older woman. Robbie watched them drive away. He wished he hadn't heard her mention another meeting in the park tonight, but he had. 
so Robbie would be there too. He had to make sure the club would be okay. It was obvious Zabrino wasn't looking out for everyone's best interest anymore. Who was he kidding? It was obvious the students of Durham School were losing their minds. That night, Robbie lo uh, locked up his house, grabbed his bike from the side yard and took off for Willow Park. <laughs> Stranger Things style. Uh, he wore his cargo pants with multiple pockets to hold a small flashlight and some beef jerky in case he got hungry. The night was dark, with stars peeking from behind a few grey clouds. Since his growth spurt, the ride was a little awkward. His legs were too long for his old bike, and his knees bowed out as he tried to pedal. He tried to stand on the pedals as he rode, but that, uh, but that just tired him out. Sorry, I keep messing up. He felt slightly guilty for telling his parents that he'd be at Dyson's. Robbie didn't usually lie to his parents, but tonight was a necessity, because they would seriously freak out if he knew he was going to forest alone at night. They weren't coming home until late, so he should be back before they eventually came home. He wanted, needed, to find out what was going on with this meeting at the park. What had to be kept so secret? Were the students meeting with Mr. Renner again? Robbie rode to Willow Park and stashed his bike in some bushes. He took out his flashlight and flicked it on and sucked in a breath to calm his nerves as he entered the forest. After all the strange things he'd been witnessing, he was worried what he might discover this time. The surrounding trees were dark and creepy. He heard an owl hoot in the distance. When he walked, he could hear the crunch of leaves and twigs under his hiking boots. He spotted a dim light source up ahead, so he turned off his flashlight and stuck it back in his pants pocket. He tried to walk slowly so as not to make too much sound. He didn't hear any voices nearby. Maybe no one had showed up yet. He snuck behind a tree and peered at the light. A lantern was set on a tree stump, but he didn't see anyone standing around. He quietly moved forward to investigate. For a split second, he thought the dim light showed flat rocks scattered on the ground. But then he blinked, and the air caught in his lungs as he stumbled back. The faint light revealed the club members buried in the ground. Only their faces were above the dirt, like creepy buried statues. For a brief, horrible moment, he wondered if they were all dead. Panicking, he reached for his flashlight, but he was shaking so hard he couldn't get it out of his pocket. When he finally got it on, he shone the, flight, the flashlight on Zabrina. Robbie flinched in surprise. Her eyes were wide open and unblinking. Zabrina? Robbie whispered as he moved closer to her. Her pupils were pinpricks, and she had an expression of shock on her ghostly face. He waved a hand in front of her eyes. Zabrina, can you hear me? No reaction. Maybe they really were dead, Robbie thought as dread seeped through his body. Robbie swallowed hard, then moved the light to Johnny. His eyes and mouth were closed, making it seem like they were dark pits instead of the eyes and instead of his eyes and mouth. Daniel, Rick, Nathan, Tina, and a few other members were all the same. Empty pale faces atop bo bodies buried in the dirt. Dead or just asleep? Guys, wake up! Robbie cried out, feeling scared and helpless. These were his friends. He had to help them. But his voice seemed to echo in the night. No one woke up or spoke to him. Robbie rushed to Nathan. He fell to his knees and brushed dirt away from Nathan's head. He reached into the loose dirt, trying to feel for a pulse on his neck. Robbie wasn't sure he felt one or even if he was feeling the correct part of the neck. Nathan, wake up, please! Robbie star started to dig around Nathan with his bare hands and perspiration sprouted on his forehead. The dirt was cold to the touch and luckily packed loosely against his friend. He dug until he got to Nathan's shoulders and then to his chest. Nathan, can you hear me? Robbie reached out his hand in front of Nathan's mouth but didn't feel any breathing coming from him. Please be okay, he thought. Please, please. Robbie gripped one hand over the other and pushed at Nathan's chest. He did his best to keep a steady rhythm, doing what he remembered of CPR from a school assembly they once had on emergency services. Finally, after a few long moments, Nathan's eyes snapped open. His mouth gasped for air. Relief came, swip came swiftly. Nathan, can you hear me? Robbie asked him, frantic. Nathan looked around in a daze as he breathed heavily. Help me get you out. Come on. I can't do it by myself. Robbie? Nathan asked. Yeah, it's Robbie. Come on, help me. As Robbie dug around Nathan's body, Nathan started to pull himself slowly out of the dirt. First his arms, then he slowly pulled out the lower half of his body. Dirt fell off him like beads of water. Then, finally, his legs were free. 
Nathan collapsed to the ground, breathing heavily. Nathan, Robbie commanded, are you okay? Can you get up? We need to help the others. Help? Nathan repeated. He looked around the club members and seemed to really awaken. Oh my gosh! Come on, help me with them! As Robbie rushed over to Tina to try to help her, Sabrina suddenly lifted out of the ground next to her. Dirt pouring off her shoulders and arms, she screamed. Get out of here! Robbie jerked in surprise, his gut tightening. Sabrina had a cruel and intimidating look on her face in the darkness. Her shoulders were moving up and down quickly as if she was breathing hard. It was like Robbie didn't even recognise her. Before he could do anything, Nathan took off running into the night. Sabrina! Robbie yelled. What's going on here? What? Get out! She screamed, waving her arms dramatically. Then she let out a horrible, piercing scream at the top of her lungs that sent fear shivering down his back. Robbie sprang away from Tina and ran after Nathan, his heart pounding in his chest. He didn't know what Sabrina was doing or if Mr. Renner was nearby. He just knew the club members needed help. Robbie caught him up with Nathan. We need to go to the police. They both ran all the way to the local police station. You're saying there are kids buried in the forest of Willow Park? A police officer at the front desk of the station asked Robbie and Nathan. Or more to Robbie as Nathan just sort of stared at the officer, not saying much. Maybe he was in some kind of shock or something. Robbie brushed his hair back in frustration. Yes, officer. Officer Talbot. Yes, Officer Talbot, please. We need to go help my friends. They could really be hurt. I unburied Nathan myself and he wasn't even breathing. Okay, calm down, kid. What's your name? Robbie Wilson. He looked at Nathan. And you? Nathan. Nathan Bates. Is this true, Nathan? Were you buried in the ground? Who buried you? The officer looked sceptical, and Robbie could feel his body shake as he cracked his tender knuckles one by one. He must have pulled on them several times tonight. Nathan blinked. I'm not really sure. Robbie looked at Nathan in disbelief. Nathan, come on! You have to remember! We ran all the way here together from the park! You saw them too! Nathan shook his head and sat on a bench, looking defeated and placing his head in his hands. Officer Talbot, please! Robbie pleaded. I'll show you myself. I don't know why Nathan can't remember. I'm telling you, we have to help them. This animatronic apocalypse stuff is getting... The animatronic apocalypse? Oh, is that what's going on here? We know all about that. Then he winked at Robbie as if Robbie was in some kind of joke. Okay, Robbie, I'll send you with another police officer to chest this out. Just give me a minute. Okay, thanks. Robbie answered, uncertain. Let me just plug my laptop in. I am loving this story. I think it's great. Okay. Doobie doobie doo. Sorry for the quick delay. Um, uh, where were we? Ten minutes later, Robbie rode into the back of a police car with Nathan. He'd never ridden in a police car before. It was sort of surreal. It made him feel like he was in trouble. Robbie could tell Nathan was upset beside him, so he didn't, uh, so he didn't ask him the questions he wanted to ask him. How did you get buried in the forest? Why don't you remember being buried in the forest? How come you didn't tell the police officer that the other club members were there too? Did Mr. Renner bury you or did Sabrina do it? Why would you let yourself be buried anyway? As they pulled up to the park, Robbie had to wait for the officer, his name was Officer Parrish, to open the door because it was locked. When the officer opened the door, Robbie hopped out of the car and hurriedly jogged uh, toward the trees. Come on, this way, he told Officer Parrish. Hold up, Robbie. I'm coming. Robbie rushed toward the spot where he found the club members buried. There was no longer a dim light lit by a lantern, and he'd left his flashlight so he couldn't see very well. Luckily, Officer Parrish had a big, uh, sturdy flashlight to light the way. I Sorry, I, I, <laughs> I, I got a bit lost, and I, I just ended with Officer Parrish had a big... Um... <laughs> Robbie spotted the tree stump. Here, this is where I found them. Officer Parrish flashed the light on the ground. The pale faces in the ground were gone. I don't see the kids, Robbie. Are you sure this is the spot? Robbie rushed to the ground and ran his hands over the surface. The dirt was loose and there were some in inden uh, uh, indentions, but it was true. The kids were no longer there. They were right here, I swear. Robbie continued to run his hands all over the area, 
digging into the surface of the ground to make sure his friends weren't buried. There were no bodies, which was good, but he did feel like some but he did feel something, sorry. He pulled out his flashlight, which had been buried in the dirt. They were all here. See? This is my flashlight. Tell him, Nathan. I, I don't know, Nathan said, sniffling. He was crying. Look, Robbie, I think it's time to get you boys home. No one seems to need help. I'm doing you a favour and not mention... Uh, I'm going to do you a favour and not mention this to your parents. I don't think they would appreciate you making a false report to the police. A false report? This isn't a false report. Robbie rubbed his face with his dirty hands in frustration. He managed to keep his mouth shut and didn't dare argue with the officer. He didn't want to get in trouble from his parents either. If the police didn't believe them, why would his mum and dad? Instead, he simply asked, Can we take my bike home too? When they were back in the police car with the bike in the trunk, Nathan finally spoke. I think I remember now, he whispered to Robbie. Robbie looked at him intently. What? What do you remember? Mr. Renner said the dirt had healing properties that purged the animatronic toxins from our bodies, so we buried ourselves. Oh. Wednesday. Uh, that morning, Robbie woke exhausted. When his alarm went off, all his covers had been thrown on the floor, evidence of a restless night. He scrubbed at his tired eyes and walked downstairs to the kitchen for some cereal. Dad was leaning against the kitchen counter, waiting for the coffee maker to finish. He was doing something with his hands. Robbie stopped short. Dad stood with a black beetle pinched between his thumb and forefinger. Robbie's heart raced. This couldn't be happening. How had it gotten his dad? He didn't know if he if he didn't know if should yell or run for his mum. Sorry, there's a typo. He didn't know if he should yell or run for his mum. He stood frozen as his dad sucked the beetle into his mouth as if he was popping a vitamin, to tossing his head back to get the bug down. His dad grabbed the counter as if he was uh, having trouble swallowing. A moment later, the beetle was consumed and his dad grabbed a cup and poured himself some hot coffee, just like he did every morning. Robbie spun around and ran up the stairs, slamming his bedroom door shut. He snatched up his comforter and dived onto his bed. Wake up, wake up, he murmured. He must still be asleep. That was the only explanation. A moment later, there was a knock on his door. Robbie, his mum called out. Time to get up. You don't want to be late for school. I can't believe Nathan didn't tell the police what happened, Dyson told Robbie on their walk to school. Yeah, I know, Robbie murmured, still reeling from seeing his dad pop up a morning beetle pill. He had told Dyson everything that had happened with the club and Nathan, but he couldn't share about his dad yet. He just couldn't. It was almost like he couldn't remember anything at first. Then he finally told me, This is getting crazy. Mr. Renner is usually role play. Uh, sorry, Mr. Renner is using role play in a really bad way. He could hurt someone. You gotta tell your parents. Robbie shook his head. I know, but I can't yet. I don't have any proof. My dad, his dad had been compromised. Whatever weird thing was happening to the school, to the police, was now happening to his dad too. He needs proof in order to believe stuff that is out of the ordinary. He believed. Uh, sorry, he barely believed about Mr. Renner and the school funding. How would he ever understand this? Robbie, maybe, as an ex maybe it was exhaustion, or the feeling of being helpless, or not knowing what to do, but Robbie turned on Dyson. Look, you're one to talk. You can't even tell your mum and dad that you don't like Little League anymore. That is not even as big as this. Dyson's eyes widened. I do like Little League. I just need a break sometimes. So why tell me? Why don't you tell your parents the truth? Dyson's face grew red, but instead of saying anything, he shook his head and walked ahead of Robbie. Sudden guilt weighed heavily on Robbie for snapping at his best friend, but Dyson didn't understand. It wasn't so easy for Robbie to talk about things that scared him, things that he didn't really understand himself. He tried to tell the police officers, but then all of the club members had disappeared, as if burying had never happened. Now, his dad, he couldn't tell his parents what was going on unless he had actual proof, Robbie wasn't sure how he would get that proof, but that wasn't any excuse to hurt his only friend and ally. Robbie ran up to Dyson and pulled on his jacket. Dyson. Something fell out of Dyson's pocket and onto the ground. Oh, sorry, Robbie said. Then his eyes widened as he spotted the familiar tin on the ground. Dyson snatched the tin up and slipped it back into his pocket. Just leave me alone, he said, and walked onto the school grounds. No, 
Not Dyson too. Bobby rubbed the back of his neck. When he walked into her homeroom, he didn't see any of the club members roaming the halls. He usually saw a few of them in the morning. Nathan and Jason were absent from homeroom, and Daniel and Rick weren't in PE. At lunch, Sabrina's table sat empty, and so did Robbie's. Dyson didn't come to eat at their lunch table. Robbie felt more alone and discouraged than ever. Eating by yourself today, Robbie? Mrs. Harp, the lunch supervisor, asked him. She had all white hair that reached her shoulders and a nice smile. Robbie nodded. Yeah. The tables look a little sparse today. The office said there seems to be some kind of bug going around. A lot of kids are out sick today. Robbie glanced at Zabrina's empty table. Really? Mr. Sanchez, another lunch supervisor, walked by and smiled. Don't you mean the kids are out preparing for the animatronic apocalypse? Mrs. Harp chuckled. Hey, <laughs> yes, that too. Then she winked at Robbie. Be sure to wash your hands often, eat your fruits and vegetables, and make sure you take any care of yourself so you don't catch any toxins. Robbie lifted his eyebrows. Um, okay, Mrs. Harp. Oh, I forgot, Robbie. I have something that might help you. She reached into her supervisor coat and pulled out a small tin box. She was about to open it when Robbie put her hand up. It's okay, Mrs. Harp. I'm all protected. Good to know, Robbie. She smiled, slipped the tin away, and walked over to another lunch table. Robbie eyed Mrs. Harp as she walked away. He cautiously scanned the other kids around the lunch area. They were talking quietly, not their usual loud selves. Something was definitely off. He tapped his fingers on the table. A lot of kids are out sick today. It seemed the entire club was out sick, except for Robbie. What if Mr. Renner had taken the club members somewhere last night after Robbie had found them? What if something weird was happening to the club members right now? Robbie's stomach tightened. He cupped his left fist into his right hand and pushed against his knuckles. Three knuckles cracked at once. There was only one thing to do. After school, he had to find his friends and make sure they were all safe. The first place Robbie checked was Willow Park. He even scanned the ground to make sure his friends weren't buried again. There were no signs of the club members. Robbie's cell phone rang. His mum was checking up on him. Hi mum, he answered. Hi Robbie, are you home? His stomach tightened. Yep. Oh, okay, good. Are you okay? You sound a little more hyper than usual. No, I'm good. All is good. Robbie's eyes squeezed shut at his lie. Okay. Running late tonight as usual. Dad will be home first. You know the drill about dinner. Yeah, I got it all under control. You sure you're okay? Yes, all good. Okay. Love you and see you tonight. Okay, bye. Robbie ended the call with a sigh of relief as he looked around the trees. The only other place he could think of uh, was Mr. Renner's house. Everything inside him told him not to go there, but what choice did he have? He pulled his hood more securely over his head and began to walk toward Newberry Lane. Robbie didn't know the exact address, but everyone knew the long silver vintage Cadillac the, the now former principal had driven to school every day. Robbie would look for his car and hopefully find his house. A little bit later, Robbie came across Mr. Renner's vehicle in the driveway of a small white house. The lawn was neatly mowed, and everything appeared to be swept clean. A couple of cacti were potted next to the front door. There was a gnome on display in the yard, which surprised Robbie. He hadn't pictured Mr. Renner as a gnome guy. Robbie looked around to make sure no one saw him as he looked in Mr. Renner's window. Unfortunately, a dark curtain concealed the window, and he couldn't see inside. He went around to the side gate that led into the backyard. It was unlocked. Robbie pushed it open and closed the gate behind him. The backyard was not as well taken care of as the front. The grass was dead and yellowed. There was a broken yard chair that was tipped over on its side. A few car parts were thrown in a pile and bags of empty cans lined the fence. There were a couple of cans of red spray paint on the ground and Robbie tilted his head at the cans before moving on. Had Mr. Renner vandalised the school? Robbie spotted a sliding door that seemed to lead into a small kitchen. He tried the door and it slid open an inch. Robbie's pulse fluttered. If he went into Mr. Renner's house, he would be trespassing. Robbie swallowed hard. He didn't want to steal anything or do anything bad to Mr. Renner's home. He just wanted to make sure his friends were okay. Robbie took a breath and slid the door open. When Robbie stepped inside, he immediately sensed Mr. Renner's house was extra warm and there was an underlying smell of something putrid and stagnant. The kitchen was out of date with mustard yellow countertops. A rusted stove was on one side of the kitchen with a scratched up refrigerator. 
There was a pile of dirty dishes in the sinks that smelled of rotten food. A fly buzzed in front of his face, and Robbie swatted it away. Robbie went still. Did he hear voices? Robbie stepped closer to the kitchen hall and heard Mr. Renner talking softly, the sound almost muffled. Robbie didn't want to give himself away, and he wondered if he should leave and get help. Maybe not from the police, but maybe the school could send someone to check Mr. Renner's house for the club members. He thought about Mr. Harp and Mr. Finkel. No, the school was compromised. Even Dyson and Robbie's own father were compromised. It had to be him. He quietly took off his backpack in order to not make as much noise and set it on the kitchen floor. Suddenly there was a hard shove on Robbie's back. Robbie went flying into the dining area. He skidded on his hands and knees onto the fuzzy carpet and quickly got to his feet. Well, what do we have here? Robbie blinked. He heard Mr. Renner's strangely muffled voice, but he wasn't looking at Mr. Renner's face. Mr. Renner, sitting at the head of a long dining table, was wearing a rubber Freddy Fazbear mask. Daniel shoved Robbie toward the dining table. The club members were all seated at the table with Mr. Renner. They stared at Robbie as if they didn't even know him. Even Nathan was there, after he remembered Mr. Renner had told him to bury himself. Robbie felt like he was standing in a room full of strangers, even though he'd known most of the kids since first grade. Their stares were eerie and dull, as if their individual personalities had been wiped clean. Um, hey everyone, Robbie spoke into the silence. Mr. Renner stood and circled the table. He wore his typical white dress shirt without his tie. His sleeves were rolled up to his elbows. He crossed his arms and showed no indication of removing the mask. Robbie, what do you have to say for yourself for breaking into my home? That's against the law. Mr. Renner used his stern tone, which was reserved for interrogating bad kids. Robbie's insides rattled. He brushed his hair back from his face. I, I didn't break in exactly. The door was open and the club members weren't at school today. I wanted to make sure they were okay. Zarina rose from her chair and stood next to Mr. Renner. She had a pinched expression on her face. Yeah, right. I think he's lying. I think you might be onto something, Zabrina. You know what this means, Fazbear Fan Club? Mr. Renner asked the kids. Robbie's the first animatronic of the animatronic invasion. Robbie stepped back in denial and Daniel shoved at him again. I'm not an animatronic, I'm just a kid. You know me, I can't believe I actually have to say this, but I'm a real person, just like you. I should have known you were an animatronic, Sabrina said, never following along with the club, always causing trouble. Animatronics need to be taught a lesson, Mr. Renner said. Robbie's guts tightened, and he didn't know if Mr. Renner was serious or not. He just knew he wanted to go home. Robbie stared at the kids as they rose from the table. Their hands had curled into fists as some were getting closer, surrounding him. Robbie stepped backward, this time out of the dining room area into the connecting living room. This isn't funny, you guys. Animatronics need to be taught a lesson, Sabrina repeated. Her expression was deadpan, distant. Taught a lesson, Daniel mimicked as he stalked Robbie. The kids stepped closer, forming a circle. As the kids surrounded him, he could see their eyes were wide and round, as if they were in a weird daze. Robbie put, his hands and, put up his hands and backed toward the fireplace. He looked around to see if he could somehow make an escape. The walls of the living room had discoloured wallpaper dotted with a tiny diamond pattern. Some of the old paper was bubbled and peeling. An old recliner sat in the middle of the room with a bulky side table. There was an, outdate, an outdated television beside the fireplace. Unlike Robbie's house, there were no family pictures on the walls at all. Guys, stop messing around! Robbie glanced at Nathan and Tina, who looked like they were under a spell. Nathan! You know this is wrong. You saw everyone in the forest. What is the matter with you all? I'm not an animatronic. The apocalypse isn't real. Mr. Runner is playing some game with you all, telling you all to eat dirt and bugs and bury yourselves in the forest. He's the bad guy, not me. Sabrina stepped up to Robbie and threw a sudden punch that hit Robbie's cheek. It stunned him speechless. He had a moment to think. She actually hit me. When another fist hit him in the shoulder, then the next in his gut. Breath whooshed out of him as Robbie stumbled to the ground. He felt a kick in his ribs and stomps on his legs. His heart was racing with fear and dread and pain uh, as pain uh, spread through his body. Help me, he thought, but he knew he was all alone. His dad had taught him that the only way to get out of a troubling situation was to help himself until he could get help from someone else. Robbie reached around for anything he could grab. His hands felt the stones of the fireplace. As he continued to, uh, to be pummeled, he spotted someone charging toward him. Adrenaline and fear spiked within Robbie. 
He stretched his hand toward a poker that was leaning against the fireplace. He managed to grab it as someone rushed him. Robbie squeezed his eyes shut and knocked the person over, releasing the fire poker. The person fell next to Robbie with a whoosh of air expelling from him. Robbie opened his eyes to see Mr. Renner lying on the carpet, impaled by the poker. Oh no, Robbie thought. Mr. Renner's body jerked on the carpet, holding the arm of the poker. The kids had stopped attacking Robbie and stepped back in surprise. Mr. Renner rolled to sit on his knees and Robbie crawled away from him. The fire poker struck out of him like a sword. Someone gasped. Robbie's body was aching, but he stood up. A wave of dizziness overcame him. Mr. Renner, I didn't mean for that to happen. Really, it was an accident. Mr. Renner let out a gurgling sound as he held the poker sticking out of his stomach, but didn't speak. His body jerked and started to convulse, strangely, twitching in odd ways. Strange grunts came through the mask. Everyone had gone completely still, staring. Their eyes widened as they looked at Mr. Renner as if he was some kind of alien. I have to go, Tina blurted and ran to the front door. Nathan blinked and Daniel, Johnny and other club members seemed to stare around the room as if suddenly realising they were at the principal's house. Let's get out of here, Nathan yelled and the others rushed out. Mr. Renner slowly pulled out the fire poker from his stomach, filling the room with weird sucking sounds. He dropped the fire poker to the floor. Dark liquid spewed out of his stomach. He stood, grabbed his leaking stomach and stumbled down the hallway until he was out of sight. Sabrina and Robbie were the only ones left. Robbie was still shaking in the shock of what happened. Sabrina stepped forward, a menacing look on her face. Loser, she said, and spat on Robbie's face before she left. Disgusted, Robbie wiped the spit off the arm, off with the arm of his hoodie. He was left standing alone in Mr. Renner's living room, feeling battered and bruised. He went to everyone's... Uh, sorry. He went to follow everyone out the door, then he hesitated. How badly is Mr. Renner hurt, he wondered. He'd never hurt anyone in his life. He was scared, but he had to make sure Mr. Renner was okay. His parents would tell him that was the right thing to do. Maybe Robbie needed to call emergency services for him. Mr. Renner, are you okay? He called out. Do you need some help? No answer. Unease turned Robbie's gut. Just in case, he picked up the fire poker once again. The tip dripped with dark liquid, but it didn't look like blood. The handle slipped in his damp palm. He switched hands and rubbed his sweaty palm on his jeans. Mr. Renner. Robbie stepped into the dining area, looking down at the dark spots on the floor. He stopped in front of the darkened hallway. Mr. Renner? He called out again. The dark substance on the carpet continued into the shadows. At the end of the hallway was a closed door with light peering from underneath. Robbie walked down the hallway, gripping the fire poker as tightly as he could. The closer Robbie got to the room, the more he trembled. The poker swayed unsteadily in his hand. Please be okay, please be okay, Robbie whispered. Robbie knocked on the door and waited. A bead of sweat trickled down his forehead. Mr. Renner, it's Robbie. Look, um, I'm sorry if you got hurt, okay? If you need help, I can call someone. After a moment of silence, Robbie slowly turned the handle and pushed the door open. The stagnant scent filled his nostrils. This time, he smelled something else as well, like a strong cleaner, or maybe it was gas. The bedroom was large. A big bed with an old-fashioned orange comforter was off to the right with a side table and lamp. There was an ancient television at the foot of the bed with the single closet door to the left. Robbie glanced down at the carpet and noticed the same black liquid on the floor leading to the closet. Mr. Renner, are you in here? Robbie swallowed hard and stepped into the room. Mr. Renner, please answer, okay? I don't want any more trouble. I'm sorry for coming here when I wasn't supposed to. I'm sorry you got hurt. I told you it was an accident. We should call the paramedics. Just then the closet door swung open and Mr. Renner stepped out. The mask was gone. His hair stuck up in crazy ways. The black substance had stained the front of his ripped white shirt. His face was deathly pale. Blue veins bulged underneath his skin, and his eyes seemed to be swallowed up by his dark pupils. Dark sweat dripped down his forehead. His lips were nearly white as they parted. A line of black drool hung from his mouth. That is such a disgusting, horrid sight. Oh my gosh. 
Fresh fear shot through Robbie at the gruesome sight. Mr. Renner stumbled toward him, his arms reaching for him. His long fingers were stained with black. Breaths rushed in and out of his mouth as Robbie gripped the poker with both hands in front of him. Mr. Renner didn't stop as he forcefully lunged toward Robbie and once again into the poker. Robbie gaped in horror as a squishy sound echoed in his ears. Black liquid spilled out of the wound. Robbie panicked, trying to pull the poker out. He had to pull with all his strength to remove it. He stepped back, but Mr. Renner wouldn't stop coming toward him. It was like he wasn't in his right mind, as if he couldn't feel the pain. He continued to grab at Robbie, latching onto his arm, crashing down on his bone. Ah! Robbie screamed from his searing pain, tears stung in his eyes. The only thing Robbie could do was push the poker at him again to try to get him to, get him to let go. The poker speared through Mr. Renner's stomach again, spewing more dark liquid out of him. But Mr. Renner wouldn't release him. Screaming, Robbie poked him again, again, again. The black liquid poured over Mr. Renner's shirt, soaking his clothes. Robbie stepped back and lost his balance, falling onto the carpet. Mr. Renner should have kneeled over in pain. He should have stopped and tried to get away. He didn't. He lunged once more at Robbie. Robbie screamed. He held out the fire poker as Mr. Renner charged at him like an obsessed maniac. The poker tip rammed straight into Mr. Renner's eyeball. A sucking wet sound with an audible pop sounded in the room. Black ooze dripped from his socket. Robbie released the poker as Mr. Renner finally fell backward into the carpet with the poker still stuck in his eye. His body convulsed on the floor. Black foam bubbled from his lips. Robbie tried to get to his feet, but he slipped in the black liquid. He crawled out of the room until he could stand, and he ran toward the front room. He thought he might throw up. He thought he might pass out. Breaths gushed out of his mouth as he rushed to the door. Robbie stumbled out of Mr. Renner's house. The cold air brushed against his face as his stomach roiled over. Day had turned into evening. Two police cars pulled up with flashing red and blue lights. Someone must have called the police. Maybe one of the club members. Robbie fell to his knees and threw up on Mr. Renner's lawn. He heaved and heaved until his stomach fell empty. A police officer rushed up to Robbie. You all right, son? Are you hurt? Robbie did his best to nod, but that just made him nauseous again. I'm okay, I think. It's Officer Parrish. <laughs> it's Officer Parrish. Remember me, Robbie? Yes. What happened here? Um, Robbie tried to get up on his own, but he was weak and the officer helped him to his feet. Mr. Renner attacked me. Mr. Renner? The principal of Durham School? Robbie blinked as tears filled his eyes. I think I... He might be dead. Officer Parrish narrowed his eyes. You're saying Mr. Renner is dead in his house? Robbie licked his dry lips. He might be. Here, son. Take it easy now. Sit down on the sidewalk and catch your breath. I'm going inside to check things out. He called over his shoulder to another officer. With me inside, Garcia. Robbie wiped tears from his face. In the bedroom... Look, you'll see. Uh, I, was, I was a bit confused. Robbie is telling them where he is. Um, Officer Parrish nodded, and the two officers stepped into Mr. Renner's house. Robbie hugged himself as he worried what was going to happen when they found Mr. Renner's body. Will I have to go to jail? What will my parents and classmates think? Will my parents lose their jobs for having a son who stabbed the ex-principal with a fire poker? Robbie started to rock back and forth on the cold sidewalk. He began to crack his knuckles really hard. He was beyond scared. It seemed like forever until the officers uh, finally exited Mr. Renner's house, concern lining their features. Robbie stood, trembling, and walked toward them. It's bad, right? Robbie blurted, pushing his hair back from his face. It's so bad, I'm really sorry. He was out of his mind. He just wouldn't stop coming at me. I, I can't really explain it, but... The officer shook his head and lifted a hand for Robbie to stop. Robbie, calm down. It's okay. Robbie's eyes widened. What's okay? You said Mr. Renner is dead. Is that right? Robbie nodded and swallowed hard. Well, unless the principal uses motor oil for blood, I don't think he's dead. There's no one inside. Robbie finally looked down at his dirty clothes and hands. Oil? Yep. I don't know what you were doing in Mr. Renner's house alone, but no one's inside, alive or dead. 
The police took Robbie home. Robbie's body ached from all that he had been through. He heard mum. Uh, he had dad. Yeah. Uh, he heard dad tell mum that he was in shock. Robbie explained the series of events with Mr. Renner and the club to his parents in a very detached voice, and then didn't speak much else to them after that. He didn't care what they thought about it all anymore. He was too tired. He showed off the motor oil and went to bed. He tossed and turned with chaotic dreams that didn't make any sense. The next couple of days, Robbie stayed home from school and his mum stayed home with him. She kept asking him if he was okay. Robbie would just nod and he patted Hopper. Even Hopper knew something was wrong. He would hardly leave Robbie's side. His parents ordered his favourite pepperoni pizza and even let him drink soda. By the weekend, Robbie was feeling a little more like himself again. His parents stayed home all weekend and didn't do any extra work at their offices. Besides vacation, he couldn't remember the last time they were all together for an entire weekend. On Sunday night, Robbie and his mom were sitting on the couch watching a rerun of a game show. Hopper was stepping, or sorry, sleeping at his feet. He heard his father talking on the phone. Nowhere to be found. Uh-uh. Yeah, that is, that is strange. There was a pause. His neighbours in the school? What about the other students? I see. Mm-mm. Okay. Thank you, Officer Parrish. I appreciate the call. Take care now. Robbie watched his dad come toward him in the front room. He sat next to him on the couch. He was wearing jeans and a v-neck shirt. He scratched his head. Who was that, Brad? Mum asked. That was Officer Parrish. It seems Mr Renner is nowhere to be found. The neighbours and the school faculty don't have any information on whether he went on a trip or not. The other club members were questioned, and no one knows anything. In fact, it seems they can't recall much of anything at all involving Mr Renner. Oh my goodness. Where could he be? Mr. His mum asked. You're saying Mr Renner is missing? Robbie asked, his eyes wide. Now, now, Robbie, don't go jumping to conclusions or theories. We don't know what's going on yet with Mr. Renner. Do you think Mr. Renner is going to come back for me? Robbie's voice squeaked. He was pretty sure Mr. Renner was dead. But how could he have moved his body out of the house? Dad sighed. You're safe, Robbie. No one is going to hurt you. Your mum and I are going to make sure you're okay. But listen, you're grounded. You should never have gone off to Mr. Renner's by yourself. Never should have gone to the forest. You knew you were supposed to come straight home after school. You lied to us. Grounded? Robbie had never been grounded before. What did that mean? No mega pizza plex for a month. No more club after school. No visiting with Dyson or your friends. Dad! Dad cut his hand through his hair. No, I don't want to hear it. You need to understand how serious this was. You could have been badly hurt. Robbie nodded. I understand. I do. I think we need to arrange our schedules to try to be home with Robbie in the evenings, Brad. Mum said, sniffling. I just feel so awful that this happened. You're right. I don't want anything like this to ever happen again. Mum, don't cry. Dad, I'm sorry I didn't tell you. I just wanted you to believe me. I was trying to get proof. Even I knew it would have sounded more like friction than reality. I wanted you, I wanted you to know that I wasn't making up stories. You do believe me, right? Dad? Mum? Yes, honey, Mum said. Dad grabbed Robbie's hand. I believe you. I don't have an explanation for it all, but I believe you. I saw your face when the police brought you home. Something terrible happened, and I don't think you'll be able to forget it for a long time. Ooh, I feel tears coming. I don't know why. <laughs> it's not an emotional story. I, it's just a very nice family at the end. Uh, happily ever after, you know. One week later. At Durham School, other than a couple of uncomfortable silent encounters with Daniel and Rick, life was back to normal. Apparently, Sabrina transferred schools. One day, she was just gone. Hopefully, she wouldn't be the present of any more clubs. Tina, Nathan, Johnny, and a few of the other club members gave Robbie small smiles when they saw him around school. No one mentioned that day at Mr. Renner's, or Mr. Renner at all. The school had gotten a new principal named Mrs. Alvarez. She liked to clap three times to get everyone's attention when she walked into classrooms, and everyone would clap back. The important thing was that she acted like a typical principal, without any weird interests in Freddy Fazbear or animatronics. The Fazbear fan club had sort of broken apart without the president or teacher chaperone, but Nathan had told Robbie that he and Tina were interested in getting the group back together. At lunch, Robbie and Dyson sat across from each other at their usual outside lunch table, Dyson with his peanut butter and jelly, and Robbie with his salami sandwich. I have good news, Dyson told him. Since your parents actually listened to you, I decided to be honest with mine too. About Little League? Dyson nodded. 
I was afraid of how they might react. I told them I love Little League, but sometimes I just want to be a kid and do fun things with my friend. Like go to the Mega Pizza Plex or join a club. And what did they say? They actually understood. They apologised for pushing me too hard. They thought it was what I wanted. That's cool. I can't go to the Pizza Plex for a while, but does that mean you'll restart the First Bear fan club with me? Nathan and Tina are up for rejoining. Dyson nodded. Yep. I'll have some extra time during the week now. All right. Robbie smiled. It's going to be so much better this time round. I know it. Dyson eyed him. But nothing too serious, okay? Just having fun with roleplay. Robbie nodded. Yep, I promise. Good. So what's first on the agenda? Dyson wanted to know before he bit into his sandwich. Well, we're going to do things to help the community. We're going to volunteer at the food kitchen. Maybe hold a food drive. Robbie paused, staring off into the distance. And we have to prepare for the animatronic apocalypse. <laughs> ah! I love that story. I love it. That's the end. That, <laughs> just in case you were wondering, that is the end. Oh, it is brilliant. The writing is top notch. It's I don't understand how these stories keep getting better, but they just are. And like, I mean, you're probably going to leave the video by now because you probably don't want to hear about my opinion. But one second, because the next story is the Bobby Dots part one. Yes, the first part of a two parter. Uh, we are only halfway through this book. The Bobby Dots part one is most of this book. <laughs> so uh, it is such a good story that we're going to get on to next time. It's going to be very long. It's going to be very amazing. And you're going to have your mind blown. Anyway, Animatronic Apocalypse. That is my favorite story right now. Like genuinely, 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 genuinely. That's my favorite story. There is something else about it, which like it, it has a different vibe. I don't know how to put it. it. It just has a vibe like we've never had before. And I really like that aspect of it. Um, it isn't very fnaf -y. Okay, I will put it out there, and I think some people are going to have criticisms with the fact that it has not a lot to do with FNAF. I'm completely fine with those criticisms, but I think that the fact that it doesn't have much to do with FNAF makes it even better, because it kind of, it's good by itself. It's a standalone story, you know? And even so, I do like the little um, kind of references to, to Freddy's and stuff. It kind of shows that there is at least a connection. And oh my god, don't get me started on theory stuff. Oh my god, the black liquid is... Oh my god. We've seen this black liquid so many freaking times. We've seen so many black kind of um, goos or black ooze. <laughs> We've seen it so many times. I'll, I'll say a few examples. But uh, if you want like a full breakdown, you should go and see my latest like theory video, which is about... Uh, I mean, the thumbnail has Nightmare on and the puppet on it with like black and white. Um, but uh, it's about uh, how evil is presented in Five Nights at Freddy's. And one thing I talk about is the fact that we do see this black liquid everywhere. And I have a feeling it's something to do with Afton's evil because we see it. Uh, I, it might not be specifically Afton's evil now that I thought about it. It might just be an effect of agony. But we see it in the Stitch Wraith Stingers when the Stitch Wraith kills the people and they bleed black down the sides of their faces. Um, we freaking, we see it. Where else do we see it? My, I'm losing my mind. Um, I guess we see it in Step Closer. We see this kind of like strange ritual with black liquid and um, candles. Uh, we also see it in the real Jake. or well, not the real Jake, but in the Stitch Wraith Stingers, there's like a reference to the real Jake and blah, blah, blah. Margie looks in the cupboard and there's black liquid everywhere. Um, uh, where else? Oh, the man in room 1280. That's the big one. The man in room 1280, uh, the end of it, you know, Afton pukes up this black liquid everywhere and that's how he transfers into the thingies. And the final one I can think of right now is Eleanor. When she is killed, these black tendrils come out of her body and it's really, really cool because a lot of this is like connected to Nightmare On. There's black tentacles or tendrils as you like call them. We have now this cult, right? This, this story is about a cult um, and we have black down the sides of the face. It seems like Nightmare On is kind of more connected to all of this than we first thought, I think. I don't know, that's just entire speculation. I should stop talking because, you know, it, I describe it in my own video 
if you go and watch it. But um, yeah, this story is really interesting. It's really amazing. It is beautifully written and I love the themes of it. What do you guys think? Tell me in the comments below. Anyway, next time we are reading Bobby Dots for the first time. I am so excited, but I'll see you then. Goodbye.